Uh, it's quite an interesting um, background music for an ACS event. We're usually not so funky. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to today's event, Firewalling Democracy, Election Security as a National Security Issue. I'm Caroline Fredrickson. I'm the president of the American Constitution Society, and so pleased to see all of you with us today for this very important conversation. ACS was founded in 2001. Uh, we are a national network of lawyers, law students, judges, and policymakers who believe that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. ACS works for positive change by shaping debate on vitally important legal and constitutional issues such as the ones that we'll discuss here today. As we all know, we have been facing a national security threat in the last two years, unlike anything our country has previously experienced. In 2016, our elections were the target of a Russian disinformation campaign to manipulate public opinion and infiltrate our voting systems. These unprecedented actions by a foreign adversary led then Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson in January of 2017 to designate election infrastructure as critical infrastructure, thereby making it a priority for federal cybersecurity assistance and protections. Although there have been ongoing conversations about what the federal government and the states can do to counter cyber threats, Little, little tangible progress has been made to prevent these incursions from reoccurring. However, new funding, including $380 million to the Election Assistance Commission, or the EAC, for the purpose of helping states secure their election systems and replace their most vulnerable voting machines, creates a real opportunity for forward progress. We are now six months away from the 2018 elections. We're also only two and a half years out from the 2020 presidential election. That may seem far away, but really it is not. What can we do today to strengthen our election infrastructure and address our vulnerabilities? What steps can be taken in these next six months and in the ensuing two and a half years to secure these systems and defend against future attempts to influence our elections and hack our voting machines. We cannot allow this to become a partisan issue. Free and fair elections are central to democracy. Securing them and in turn securing the legitimacy of our democracy requires a united and bipartisan response that leverages the best tools available from American public and private enterprises. To begin our discussion today, I'm going to first turn it over to A.J. Bedalia. A.J. is the manager for Google's public policy and government affairs team. Google has been making, doing a, a, quite a lot of work in this space, and he's going to give us an overview of what Google has been doing, including its protect your election tools. So now I'll turn it over to AJ. Thank you, AJ. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, and thank you, Caroline, um, for uh, helping host this event uh, here. And Google is very proud um, to be supporting this effort. It's a really important issue. Um, so I figured I'd take about 10 minutes here today to give you a bit of an overview about how we're viewing the 2018 elections, both in terms of how we're going to be informing it, um, how we're going to be supporting it, and how we're going to be protecting it. Um, so kind of moving forward, I want to give you guys a sense of kind of what the three topics I'm going to be covering. Um, so first, um, the way we view it is on the front end, how do you engage citizens? How do you give them the information they need to participate in the democratic process? Um, second is, how do you support the back end? So how do you protect campaigns and elections um, through the expertise that Google has gained um, over the years in terms of the technological work that it does? Um, and then finally, how do you ensure high quality elections information so when people are searching for information, information that they're getting comprehensive and authoritative sources? Um, so on the first bucket, um, you know, as folks may know, um, Google's motto has been to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. 
Um, so the way we view uh, elections work is in a very similar kind of lens, which is, um, you know, how do you um, figure out what users want when they're searching for something, um, and how do you meet their needs on civic engagement in particular? Um, so in 2014, Google uh, actually uh, fielded a foundational user research study to study basically user attitudes in, in voting and elections in 2014. Um, and what we found there is that folks are most interested in kind of three very basic concepts, which is how do you vote, where do you vote, um, who's the candidate, um, and what are the results of the vote, essentially. Um, so what I put up on the screen here, actually, is Google Trends data. Um, and for those that don't know Google, what Google Trends is, it's a free uh, service that we provide that folks can use um, that essentially shows what folks are searching for on the Google search engine. Um, and so what I have up on the slide right now um, is the term where to vote. Um, and the time frame there is 2008 to 2018. Um, and so what you'll notice uh, is there are some giant spikes during election periods, um, including during the midterms, um, and then not much else in between those time frames. Um, and this is true every time in every country. Um, and so we're using this trends data, using that research strategy that I mentioned, um, we created an election civics team in 2007. Um, and it was a group of engineers that kind of saw this um, and realized we could do a better job of answering these questions. You know, we could provide authoritative and comprehensive information to people. Um, and that's really been our goal over the last 10, 11 years or so. Um, so on the civic engagement side, you know, we have, we kind of, going back into the buckets that I was talking about previously, um, we've built a suite of tools that folks can use through our platforms. Um, the first is something as basic as candidate, candidate information, which is who's running, what's the, bio, what's the biographical information, and glean from authoritative sources, right? So the goal here is to get people quick, easy information they can access, and, but frankly, again, from sources that are easy, that are authoritative, that folks know that what they're getting is the truth. Um, the next three are really the core part of engaging in the democratic process, right? So how do you register to vote? Um, how do you vote and where do you vote? Um, and this is something that we've invested um, a lot of time and effort into over the last several years in particular. Um, and you know, it's the idea that um, users, when they search for something, they want the answer there, right? They don't want to go through three or four different web websites or you know, they, uh, usually when you're trying to get uh, access to someone, you're trying to get them in the information as quick as possible. Um, so something we did in the 2016 elections is essentially creating a how to register vote tool right in the Google search engine, um, which essentially would give you a step-by-step -step process based on where you are, on deadlines, on documents you need to fill out, you know, what kind of ID you need, um, and things like that as well. And what we found actually um, when we launched this tool is that we were seeing users interact with it two or three times more often with that feature than any other search engine feature that we had. Um, think about that for a second, considering everything that Google Search offers. Um, and that was very obvious to us once we started to do that, um, how much people crave this kind of information. Um, and so we're taking that a step further, right? And so we have, we have um, worked with organizations such as the Voting Information Project um, and the Balfour Center and a whole host of other organizations to help ensure that when folks are searching this kind of information online, the key part of how do you engage in our democratic process um, that is clear, that is concise, that is truthful, um, you know, and that is available to you in an easy to access step-by-step -step format. Um, and then the final part, of course, is results, right? So if you're searching for something, you don't want the results in Alaska unless you specifically search for it. You probably want the results in wherever you're living, right? Whether it's congressional candidates, it's ballot initiatives, or whatever else there is. So we've worked with a host of um, of uh, official distributors to make sure the election results are also available to people so they're, they're again, able to engage in the democratic process and make sure they know what the results of their vote is. Um, the final thing I wanna mention in this kind of bucket um, is, the, is the civic information API that we're working on here. So what we essentially do um, is that we have provided, uh, created a civic information API that folks can link into, that developers can build programs around um, to encourage and make it easier to, for voters to get to the polls. Um, so a great example of this is actually Expedia and Airbnb. Um, so they send targeted emails to those who will be out of town on election day, and they link them to Google tools, and they remind them to vote early uh, or absentee. And so this is some of the small kind of projects that we kind of push out and encourage folks, because part of, part of the, the you know, point of securing elections, right, is to make sure people are civically engaged and actually engaging in the democratic process. 
Um, so that's a small recap of some, some of the civic work we're doing, but getting into the real meat of, I think, what today is about um, is to talk about some of the work we're doing to protect campaigns and elections here. Um, and so, you know, look, Google, um, you know, has, has experience with cybersecurity, uh, and it has a lot of experience with network management, and that's frankly been some of the issues that we've been facing in campaigns and elections over the past several years. Um, so we've seen a rise of digital attacks, the sounds, information, oh, Sorry, I'm going backwards. There you go. Um, so we've seen a rise of digital attacks um, being used to silence information, um, particularly when the surge around elections, right? And, and we have been trying to understand the nature of this threat. Um, and we've been playing catch up with our own expertise, frankly. Um, and you don't have to look that far for examples on this. Um, you know, a great example is just hours before the polls opened um, in the Dutch elections last year. Um, one of Holland's leading election information sites went offline. It was DDoSed. Um, and this is a key website that people use to access to help decide their vote. And at Google, we believe that free and fair elections depend on people having access to information when they need it. And frankly, around the world, the sources of that information are very seriously under attack. Um, and these types of attacks aren't becoming, they're becoming easier. They're becoming cheaper and they're, they're getting better organized. Um, and we want to do our part to help. So what are we doing? Um, so a couple things. First is in 2017, um, we started uh, a program that we've been pushing through, which is supporting 10 elections in 10 countries through outreach and training. And you see it on the slide up there, which is, you know, we trained 1,000 journalists. We supported election critical websites to protect them from DDoS attacks. Um, we handed out uh, physical security keys, which I'll cover later on in this uh, presentation. Um, and then in, in specific countries, we also train campaign staff and candidates and their policymakers on how to be digital hygiene secure. Um, and we've had overwhelming demand for this. Um, we're going to be expanding it this year to cover more elections, offer additional products, uh, and keep up with the changing nature of digital attacks. Um, so this includes adding tools to help improve conversations around elections, um, add advanced phishing protection for people, uh, and particularly making sure that folks that are most at risk for being attacked uh, are secure or aware of what they need to do. So uh, as, as was mentioned previously, one of the big things that we're doing here is the Protect Your Election website that we're launching um, through Jigsaw, uh, which is one of our um, key hubs that kind of looks at these issues and particularly does counter narrative work uh, in this area. Um, so Protect Your Election is a suite of free tools that we've had that we're expanding further in 2018 um, to protect election critical sites and sources from the most pervasive digital attacks. Um, so what, what we're taking is field research that we have conducted um, and applying it to the very people and institutions that are critical to an election. Um, so whether it's journalists, it's campaigns, it's candidates, it's NGOs, it's election monitoring websites. Um, and often these people aren't fully aware of some of the threats that they're facing. Um, because they think, you know, we're not that important. Uh, they, they think, uh, you know, we're just an NGO that works on these issues. It's the government or it's somebody else that works on this stuff. But what we've noticed is a coordinated nature on these attacks. Um, and the goal here, again, is access to information. How do you make sure that at the time that people need it, particularly in, in weeks reading, leading up to an election, that this, this information is available to folks? Um, and it's hard to know how to be safe online, right? I mean, there are conflicting tools. There are conflicting... Um, suggestions and folks don't fully know how to how to follow a step-to-step -step guide here um, and so some of the things that we're trying to do is provide digital security trainings we're trying to make sure that people are aware that you know here are the simple steps that you can take um, which kind of brings me to my next point which is some of the digital hygiene work that we're doing here really is we're trying to focus it around three very common digital attacks that we're seeing here um, and I'm sure folks have seen this in some way shape or form um, throughout your time online uh, but I'll cover it just in case you don't um, which is phishing malware, and DDoS. Um, so phishing, you know, I think folks are pretty well aware of this, is an attempt to get on our authorized access to your account through something that looks legitimate, whether it's a website, or it's an email, or it's a link, or it's, you know, an attachment or something else that you're looking. Oftentimes, these are also linked to malware. So that's a script that's run on a website, or it's an attachment received in your email, sometimes from a phishing attempt. Um, and, and that runs on a computer or a mobile device um, and essentially takes, a, takes advantage of that access. Um, and then finally, a DDoS attack, which is actually considering how easy cloud computing is to have access to now, is a simple and very inex inexpensive way to take a website online. It essentially just hammers requests at that website until it goes down. Um, and usually what we've noticed is DDoS in particular, because it's so easy to do, is used to target critical work, 
whether it's investigative, it's to silence journalism, it's to stop freedom of information during elections. Um, and so what we're building and what we're doing is we're, we're providing both general access to users as well to defend against them, but also providing access to folks that are most suspect or most possible to be attacked on these areas. So to kind of go over that, I'm not gonna cover this slide, but I'm just gonna give you a chance. When we look at these programs, we kind of look at it in those three buckets that I just mentioned. Um, so phishing attacks. What are some of the easiest ways to defend yourself in a phishing attack? Um, so a couple areas. First is um, we built a couple products that we highly recommend, and whether you use our products or you use somebody else's products. Um, first is the concept called password alert. Um, so this is an add-on that we added on the Chrome, but there are a variety of ones available, um, and you can use the one that you feel most comfortable with, which basically just tells you that when you t enter in a password into a website that isn't, uh, a, in our case, a Google website, it'll alert you and tell you you're using two of the same passwords on two different websites. Pretty simple, but again, if you're talking about how do you protect yourself um, from ensuring that you don't have password one, two, three, or you don't have you know, seven different websites using the same password, particularly something as important as your email, or important as your website, or your administrator login, or whatever else it is, that's important. Second is the use of a password manager. Um, so we have a password manager called SmartLock, which again, we provide free to everybody, but again, there are a number of ones, number, number of them out there. Um, and that essentially just creates custom passwords for every site that you run. Um, and you know, again, so you don't have to write it down on a sticky note, right, and put it next to your computer, or you don't have to put it in an unsecure area. Um, this essentially just creates a new password that is custom built, you know, for protection for your website, and it'll load those passwords for you. Um, and finally, and obviously the, the, the one that everyone seems to talk about often is two-step verification, um, which is the idea that it doesn't take just a username or password to get into your account, right? It needs one additional step, right? That's why it's called two-step, um, to get into your account. So oftentimes people will sometimes use a text message to their phone, They'll use, you know, there's RSA ID tokens with the numbers. You can use, a, you can get a phone call. You can do a whole host of different things. Um, but again, that is an additional step that if somebody else has gone and uh, taken advantage of your password and your username, um, that there's an additional step there to protect you. Um, the final thing I want to talk about, and I'll actually skip forward on this one, is the advanced protection program. Um, and I mentioned previously that our goal here is also to help the people who are most suspect of these attacks. So APP um, is a program that essentially provides an additional layer of security for folks who feel like they're targets. And this is something that we're really pushing for the 2018 elections here. Um, how do you get folks that, whether it's the campaign manager for a national race or a state race, or it's an election website, or it's an NGO or something else, how do you make sure that if they're using a Google account that they're getting the top level information? So a couple things we do here. First, we require physical two-step authentication. So this isn't a text message, this isn't anything else, it's literally a physical token, which I'll show you guys right here, um, that you have to put in to your computer before you can access any Google product. Um, and this is something that we've actually been giving away um, under as much as we can um, to, to key folks who are working on these areas. Um, so that's one, which is physical access um, to, uh, to something before you can log into your account. Um, this, the, the, the next three is really um, taking an additional step from what we already do. First, um, we provide an additional layer of protection for malicious and insecure uh, applications. So if you're an NGO that is running on the Google Suite apps and you feel like you might be under attack, um, if you're using the APP program, you know anything that's put on your Google Drive or is downloaded from there has an, even an additional extra layer. <coughs> Second, stronger vetting. So one of the other ways that we find people um, are taking advantage of attacks is they say they're doing a recovery. They're trying to get their password back. Um, and oftentimes those are an attempt to use phishing attempt to get access to your account. So we do additional vetting there as well. So if you are trying to gain additional recovery access to a Google account that's using this, um, that there's an another step before it sends you that email saying, um, you know, you need to recover your account. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, deep scanning for incoming documents. Um, so anything that's coming in through an email, anything that's coming through a doc, has an extra step beyond the traditional scanning that we do um, to make sure that you are protected here. So, uh, let me move on actually. Uh, so the, the next bucket I wanna cover is malware. Um, so malware, as I mentioned, is you know, somebody who's trying to run a script or a, pass or, or a software application or something you know, that can harm a computer and possibly have someone get unauthorized access. Um, the big thing I wanna highlight here is the concept of safe browsing. Um, so this is a tool that we've created, but there are a lot of other companies that do other things here as well, which is um, 
it alerts you before you visit a website that may have malicious information on there. Um, this is something that's built into Chrome or browser, but we've also shared it with other companies, um, and it currently keeps three billion devices safe from Firefox, Safari, and the iOS platform. Um, and safe browsing is, you know, exactly what it sounds like. It shows warnings, whether it's a link you're clicking in your email, or it's something that you're visiting on a website somewhere and you click somewhere, um, and you click on that website to a link that they may not be aware is malicious or it may have been taken over. Um, we want to give folks the information they, they need to make decisions that they feel is appropriate. Um, and in Google Drive, once again, if you're using Google Drive, one of the things that has been standard practice that we're continuing to get better at, which is make sure we're scanning files and viruses, um, ensuring that anything you're putting on our platform or on your computer from our products, even if it's not from us, um, has at least some base, lever, base layer of, of check that's happening here to ensure that you know, it isn't malicious or isn't running a script that can take over your computer. Finally, um, the final thing I want to mention is Project Shield. So I had mentioned DDoS attacks previously, which is, again, becoming an extremely popular way um, to take down critical information. And Project Shield is something that um, we are just launching, and it is a free service that uses Google technology using reverse proxy to keep news and election websites protected from DDoS attacks. So it's completely free. NGOs can use it. Journalists can use it. Anybody can use it. Um, and essentially, the goal here um, would be that it runs requests that might be malicious through Google Networks first before it goes to yours. Um, and the idea here, again, is to protect the most critical infrastructure that we have, which is information, in the weeks running up to an election. Um, and I'll give you a great example. I had talked to you guys about the Dutch website that had gone down uh, last year. So after they had gone down, they had contacted us. And they are now using Project Shield. Uh, and they were able to get back up because of our efforts. And even though they have been attacked, so far, so good. Finally, uh, I figured I would give a quick sense of where you can get some more tips on this. Um, securityplanner.org gives you a great person, uh, personalized security checkup with recommendations on what you can do with your computer, with your accounts, with everything else. The Belfer Center, which I had mentioned previously, we partner with um, very closely here, uh, has a cyber playbook. Um, that gives you actionable tips that will make your campaign's information more secure. Uh, and then finally, LockdownYourLogin.org gives you online security tips from the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Um, memorize these sites, visit them. They have incredible resources. Um, I cannot say enough good things about them. We work with them closely. We support their efforts as well. Um, knowing where to get good information is just as important as getting the information in the first place. Um, the additional thing I just want to cover um, because it's something that I think folks are very interested in, um, which is ensuring high-quality elections information. Um, the Internet has done wonderful things. Um, the openness has made benefits available to everyone, um, but that also means that it is contingent on us and it is our responsibility to make sure that that information is high-quality and authoritative. Um, and in 2017 and 2018, Google has taken a number, number of steps to tackle malicious actions that have been targeted at our users. The The... The three big things I just want to highlight um, is we've made quality improvements in search. Um, we've had better evaluation methods to inform ranking improvements. We've made updates to our content policies. We have introduced new feedback tools that people can report. Um, and we've made public changes to our search quality reader guidelines, which is really what are used to qualify whether something is an authoritative good link or not. Um, and we've seen great results on this. Um, finally, we're doing a better job at surfacing news. Um, we're providing many ways to make sure that authoritative sources are getting ranked higher, that news that people are looking for are, is accessible, um, and that folks are able to get the information they need. And then finally, as you may have heard, we have a misrepresentation policy for news and ads, ensuring that websites that misrepresent themselves to the users are not allowed on Google News and don't get ads revenue for us. And that includes increasing our guidelines for those that are posting ads at Google. That's it. Folks have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, absolutely. So something we actually uh, just announced on Friday um, is we're going to be providing disclaimers for election ads. Um, 
Um, so it depends on the ad. Um, so obviously we serve different types of ads, including search ads, display ads, and things like that as well. But um, for example, any search ad you see, it's gonna have a disclaimer at the bottom that says paid for by. In addition, um, and I'm happy to, we actually just posted this on our blog on Friday, um, but we're also gonna have a transparency center um, that shows every single election ad buy that's been made as well. Um, so you can go through there and see who's doing what and who they're targeting and things like that as well. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I do want to thank you, AJ, um, for that really enlightening presentation. I know I get anxious every time I think about those things. Uh, I'm trying to explain to my mother what phishing is, and don't don't click on that link, um, even if it's from me. Uh, um, but I really do appreciate your presentation and everything Google has been doing um, in this area. Um, so now we're going to turn to today's um, panel discussion. Uh, and to lead this discussion, we have a truly dear friend of ACS, of mine, and a real expert on elections and technology, Philippa Scarlett, um, better known to us as Pippa. Pippa was a member of the Obama administration serving in both the White House as the Deputy Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator and in the U.S. Department of Justice as the Deputy Associate Attorney General. Before that, she was a litigator at the law firm of Kirkland & Ellis, where, among other matters, she handled voting rights litigation. Current member of our Board of Directors, as I said, um, and a dear friend of all of us and an expert, please join me in welcoming Pippa. beg your pardon. <laughs> Hi, all. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Google for hosting us and feeding us and giving us their space. And I want to say a special thank you to uh, Jenny Katzman and Deborah Perlin, both ACS directors for policy and program for bringing us all together. And also to Samantha Franks, ACS policy and program fellow for supporting this effort. And to Caroline, thank you, Caroline, for your introduction and for your tremendous leadership of ACS over these many years. Uh, and to our esteemed panelists, thank you so much for being willing to share your time and expertise. Um, I just want to take a moment to talk about why we're doing this panel. My hope was, um, it seems that one thing that might be clear in the present moment that we're in, particularly in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of energy for public engagement and public discourse. And political parties, community organizers, students groups, religious organizations, the gamut, almost everyone under the sun, it seems, uh, are particularly energized to have their voices heard in the political process these days. But even if we have record numbers of new candidates running for office, which it seems we do, as well as record numbers of people actually going to the polls, which it appears maybe will happen as soon as these midterm elections, all of that effort and energy will basically be for naught if votes cannot be accurately counted. Whether that be because of administrator failure in the counting of our uh, ballots cast, or cyber intrusions that manipulate our voter rolls or our tallying of our election results. So we're on the heels of the 2016 U.S. presidential election, where it's been widely and publicly confirmed that actors attempted to hack into some of our voting systems. While there's no evidence that the vote totals were hacked in 2016, we do know that hackers were testing the waters. And that is concerning, to put it mildly. And so the question is, and the question for us, is are we ready for the 2018 elections, midterm elections, and beyond? So our aim for this panel is to create an opportunity to have an interdisciplinary discussion about this cornerstone of our democracy, election security. Often policy discussions are in their silos. So our hope here is to bring 
experience and expertise and perspectives, perspectives from different disciplines, election administration, election and voting rights law, national security and foreign policy, and tech, and the white hat hacker community to tell us about how we can work to support our vibrant democracy together. So I know we, I don't even have a watch, but someone's keeping me uh, together here. Um, I'm not gonna uh, go through the bios. You have bios uh, in front of you. I will just quickly introduce our panelists and then we can jump right in. Uh, just a housekeeping matter. So each person is gonna present literally four to five minutes, friends. Um, their their uh, a, a quick overview of their core of their work as it relates to election security. And then we're gonna go into a conversation and we hope to be in dialogue and I will encourage our panelists to speak with and bounce off of each other as well. And then we'll have 20 minutes for Q&A thereafter. So that's it. Uh, so I'll start with Commissioner Hicks. If you could kick us off, please. Great, thank you for having me here. Um, it's always an amazing time for me when I think about elections and, and going forth with all these other things. But um, in my five minutes, I wanna give three quick things. One, uh, Caroline talked about it a little bit um, in terms of critical infrastructure. Um, in 2016, we witnessed a foreign actor trying to manipulate our elections. There's no evidence that any votes were changed or manipulated, but that doesn't mean that we can't be more vigilant. Um, we would never ask a state if a, if a submarine was based off that coast for that state to defend it. So, but we're asking states to defend the election process, but um, the president and the Congress has given $380 million to help the states to provide that because the states are the ones that actually run the elections. The EAC, which was founded in 2002 after the Help America Vote Act, uh, which I serve as a commissioner. We are currently under um, staffed in terms of not having a full quorum. There's two commissioners there now, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still move forward with the, the process of um, securing our elections. Um, so what are some of the things that we're asking folks to do? What, what are we doing? We basically, we're going around the country talking to election officials about um, the resources that we have for them. Each state will get at least $3 million, um, and it's based on a population uh, format. So um, particularly California is gonna get the most, and smaller states like Wyoming and Montana are gonna get that $3 million. Each state has to provide a 5% match, and um, they'll move from there. Uh, we hope that they'll use this money for 2018, but in realistically viewing this, um, a lot of this is gonna go towards 2020 um, in terms of the purchase of new voting equipment. Congress has basically laid out a formula saying that they want people to buy voting equipment that has a paper trail, um, but we wanna make sure that people realize that if they get a system that has a paper trail, that it has to be um, accessible for those who have disabilities as well. Um, so that's that piece of it. Um, in 2016, I had the pleasure of going to um, the um, Netherlands to talk to 20 other countries about the process of elections because this is nothing new in terms of the um, attempted manipulation of elections. Uh, for decades, people have heard in the United States about how uh, Republicans need to vote on Wednesday, Democrats vote on Thursday, that sort of misinformation that's flowing out. Um, so the way that it's done now is more of a cyber tech sort of way. Out. So basically, um, you need to realize where you're getting your information from. So I was able to meet with Google back in July to talk to some folks about some of the things that we hope to work with them on. Um, since I'm probably running short on time, I will talk about two other things. Um, one, the 
thought that um, the elections are run by hundreds and hundreds of people is basically a misnomer. There's about 8,000 jurisdictions in the United States, and for the most part, those jurisdictions are run by one or two individuals. And those one or two individuals are not only running the elections, programming the machines, and doing all these other things, they're also driving the school bus and doing payroll. So they don't have the resources that they need to basically secure the election process. So what the EAC is doing is we are offering IT training. So what we are doing is we're, for states that are requesting it, we're going out to those state conferences where those folks who might not have the money to come into DC to go to their individual state conferences and offer a six to eight hour training course on IT security. Basically some of the things that um, was talked about earlier, but mostly um, how they can secure the process and use the resources that we have. Also, I would be remiss and my staff would um, basically revoke if I don't tell you to look at our website because we have a video on security. It's basically a cartoon video. It's about five um, minutes long uh, under eac.gov and it's on our, our header page right now to look at that to see some of the other things that I'm skipping over in sort of the time frame that we have here. So lastly, I would talk about um, DHS. So in 2017, uh, with two weeks left in the, in the Obama administration, Jay Johnson designated elections as critical infrastructure. That was looked at as a political move, and then six months later, John Kelly, who was then Secretary of Homeland Security, kept that designation, removing that thought that this was a political um, move by the Obama administration. It's, not a, it's a bipartisan issue um, to say that our elections are so vital that they are critical infrastructure, basically like banks, waterways, um, transportation, the electrical grid, it's ele elevated to that level now. So I serve on the Government Coordinating Council on the Executive Board uh, as chair of the EAC. Um, and so we have meetings, we talk about some of the things that need to be done to move forward with this. It's gonna be a long process, but um, we hope to do more for the 2018 election and moving forward. So what's my question for you? My question for you is what can you do to ensure that our elections are secure? One thing that you can do is serve as a poll worker because that's a frontline defense of what's going on in the polling place um, on election day. Um, you know, the AC has talked a lot about cybersecurity, but we also talk about physical security of the voting process as well, making sure that those machines are secure, making sure that the ballots are secure and so forth. So if you get an opportunity, serve as a poll worker. You'll love it, you'll get paid, and, and so forth. Um, so with that, I think I will end so that I can answer questions um, that come from the, from the crowd. Thank you so much, Commissioner Hicks. And I'd like to kick it to you, uh, Joe Lorenzo Hall, who's our chief, the chief technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology. If you can tell us a little bit from the tech perspective and the hacker community perspective. Sure, so thank you very much, uh, Pippa and uh, uh, fellow panelists. Um, I've been studying computerized and network voting systems for about 15 years, so a long time. And let me tell you, I have to totally agree with, <laughs> uh, with uh, Commissioner Hicks. Uh, please be a poll worker. If that isn't as exciting as you think it's gonna be, maybe volunteer for nonpartisan election protection from Lawyers Committee, and, and I'm sure all of you, if you don't know that, you know someone who can, who can point you in the right direction. Come see me if you don't. If you don't know how you can you can do stuff, given what skills you have, um, my colleagues and I in the computer security community have been uh, talking about this the, uh, problems with voting machines, with voting systems, with our election uh, systems in general for many years. And while we have always been really concerned with the prospect for tampering over the you know last 15, 20 years, most of what we see are error, you know, sources of error. Things happen, things don't work correctly. Um, it was only in 2016 where we started seeing. Pretty, pretty serious evidence of adversarial attacks, malicious parties coming in and, and, and messing with certain aspects of the voting system. And, and make no mistake, we, fare, we, we face pretty serious challenges when it comes to cybersecurity. There's so many election officials, they're highly under-resourced. They didn't grow up to be a cybersecurity warrior. <laughs> they grew up to be a, 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 you know, someone who works in, in, the, in the civic uh, area. Um, and in 2016, we had two voter registration systems compromised, and even those stories are actually good stories of IT defenses working. You know, not, they weren't, they, things could have been a lot worse. 
Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have an opportunity to make them better. Um, I, the case of Reality Winner, if you haven't heard of that case, I, I suggest you type those words into Google. That was a NSA contractor who stuffed a top secret document in her pantyhose that taught us that Russian military intelligence was uh, compromised a voting system vendor and then used that as a platform to spearfish 120 local and state election officials. That's why phishing, malware, denial of service attacks, those are still the big three, not even just for elections, but for any aspect of cybersecurity. Um, despite all the, the doom and gloom, uh, we have a lot of people involved with efforts to improve cybersecurity. Commissioner uh, Chair Hicks, I'm, I'm having a hard time calling you chair. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> I'll get over it. Uh, chair Hicks mentioned a bunch of them. Harvard, the Center for Internet, uh, for Center for Internet Security has another, has another really good set of resources. And we have election officials actually stepping, stepping up. So Noah Pretz from Cook County, Illinois has his uh, Cook County's security playbook you can look at. Neil Kelly from Orange County, California has his too. So you're starting to see this, a bigger conversation, a lot of information sharing going on. And that's really, for 2018, the thing that many of us are stressing more than every, anything. Information sharing. You need to know, you know what your state is. <laughs> you, you need to know what your readiness is, so how ready you are. But you also need to be prepared for things that may happen all of a sudden. Just last week, we had an attack on an election in Knox County, uh, Tennessee. Uh, there was, for whatever reason, there was a mayoral election that could have been it where one of the candidates was a former pro wrestler, so I'm not sure if that's exactly what it was. But the election re result site and all of their infrastructure went down due to a denial of service attack. And I, I think this is a misquote, but the IT manager there said, there's no way to prepare for this. I think what he meant is there's no way to prevent this. That's certainly true. But there are tools like Project Shield or Galileo's, the Athenian project, these are tools that basically make it impossible for your website to go down given one of these attacks. People should use those things. Um, at CDT, I'll just spend a, a minute talking about what we're doing. Um, there, there's a lot going on. So CDT is one very narrow sliver of, of all the, the efforts going on. But we're focusing in three areas. Cybersecurity 101 for state and local election officials and government uh, in general. Um, trying to map out what a path towards better post-election audits look like, and I'll talk about this in a sec, and then building bridges between local election officials and local cybersecurity talent. So Cybersecurity 101 is extremely important because you know, people like me live and eat and breathe this all day, but if it's not something that, that you're trained to do, it's really hard to understand how to keep yourself safe. So that basic education is necessary. Uh, in, two, in 2016, something like 75% of all voters voted on paper or on a machine that keeps some paper record. But unfortunately, the, the audit, uh, state of audits, so how, how many jurisdictions actually count those records to check and see if the result actually matched what you would get from a, from a hand count, that's not as ubiquitous. And so we have to do a lot of work to make sure that people can uh, uh, inventory their ballots correctly, can find them, they know how to count them, they can count as few as they need to to confirm that the outcome is correct. And then finally, we're working on ways to try and match not just federal cybersecurity resources like DHS and Election Assistance Commission and things like that, but there's a lot of folks in the InfoSec community, community that are just around, you know, in your local community. And there's no reason why they couldn't volunteer, not just as poll workers, but to do go the next level and actually help uh, election officials be a little bit more secure. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joe, and love to have you share some stories from DEF CON, too. Uh, <coughs> Professor Chara Torres Spessely. Spellacy. Spellacy, I'm uh, so sorry, of, of Stetson University. Quicker. Did you try to find it? This one? Yes. Thank you. Of Stetson University, who will talk with us about election and voting law. All right, uh, good afternoon. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy, and I teach constitutional law at Stetson. As an occupational hazard, um, I watch a lot of congressional hearings, especially those that relate to election administration and what happened in the 2016 election. There are a lot of different aspects of this to be very alarmed about. One of them that uh, really concerns me is what has been mentioned before, the lack of an audit trail for paperless ballots. Professor, one yeah. moment. It looks like this is not oh. populating the screen above. Um, there we, there we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
much. Tonight. Thank you. Um, so, one of the things that I am also concerned about is, uh, as I looked back at the 2016 election, uh, it seemed to me that federalism had flipped from being a real strength to a real vulnerability. And what got me not sleeping at night was listening to state election officials testifying before Congress, objecting to the Department of Homeland Security's designation of elections as critical infrastructure. Since a central theme of uh, my argument is about federalism, let me pause here and define my terms. A synonym for federalism is states' rights. And the Supreme Court has been <coughs> very clear that the, the 50 states are not controlled by the federal government. One way to think about this is the way that Justice Kennedy framed it in a case called Thornton. He wrote, the framers split the, the atom of sovereignty. It was the genius of their idea that our citizens would have two political capacities, one state and one federal, each protected from incursion by the other. And the Supreme Court has also been clear that the states are not under federal control. In a key case called Prince from the 1990s, uh, which was looking at federal background checks for guns, the question there was, could the federal government force local law enforcement to run background checks on an interim <laughs> basis? And the Supreme Court was um, quite forceful and said no. Um, you could not force uh, Sheriff Prince, who uh, was a sheriff in Montana, to run federal background checks even on a temporary basis. Uh, basically, under principles of federalism, the uh, Montana sheriff could not be commandeered by the federal government. Uh, more recently, in the Sebelius case, which was the Supreme Court looking at the Affordable Care Act, the, there, the, the justices uh, were also clear that the federal government cannot use congressional spending power to coerce the states. And thus, I am worried that even if the federal government is doing its damnedest to thwart the, the next hack, that they literally cannot force the states to help defend um, our elections. Now, I think for a very long time, uh, the risk of there being hacks, especially in a presidential election, were very much poo-pooed um, in many circles. And there was a good reason that um, people had such skepticism. Basically, as uh, Commissioner Hicks uh, indicated, there is a lot of variety in the way that the states uh, organize their elections. And even within states, you may not have the same election technology being used county to county <coughs> to county. And so I think if our uh, conception is a lone wolf hacker, then I'd agree. I don't think a lone wolf hacker could um, you know, undermine the entire presidential election because they'd have to figure out hundreds if not thousands of different ways that elections are administered. However, if we are in a world where we are up against industrial strength hacking or nation state strength hacking, then I'm much more concerned. Because then if you were trying to target the next presidential election and you were a state actor, then what you would focus on are either the, the state that is the weakest link or alternatively you would focus on a few key swing states um, or you would just focus on the vendors that provide election technology across jurisdictions. Now the good news, as we've heard, is there is uh, $380 million that is allocated for election security. The bad news from my point of view is that they decided to give it to all 50 states and not target it on the states that have paperless ballots. And so as a consequence, only two states, by my counting, and this is um, some, some numbers I'm borrowing from the Brennan Center, 
Uh, only Delaware and Arkansas are going to get enough money out of this federal pot to actually fix the paperless ballot problem. And so a state like Pennsylvania, which has been a swing state uh, in many recent elections, uh, is only going to get about a quarter of their costs covered, which is not enough. And thus, <laughs> federalism <laughs> is giving me heartburn. <laughs> um, I am very worried that because we haven't invested enough money to fix this problem today, that we'll be here in a couple of years and we'll have the same problem that we have American elections that we can't properly audit in an environment where we have nation states, foreign actors, who are hell-bent on disrupting American elections. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Laura Rosenberger, who's director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy and also a senior fellow <laughs> at the German Marshall Fund of the United States to give us the international view Thanks so much. It's great to hear my fellow panelists and, and so many of the different perspectives I think that are so useful and, and critical for this kind of conversation. And, and thanks, um, Pippa, and to ACS for, for hosting and, and the invitation. I'm just going to lay out a couple of quick things, and, and we can do more in the conversation in the Q&A. But um, the first is that I think for a lot of Americans, um, especially early on in the wake of the 2016 election and the first intelligence community assessment, which came out in January of 2017, <laughs> A lot of this conversation about what happened uh, with the Russian interference in the 2016 election sounded like a spy movie jumped out of the, you know, out of the movie screen and into our lives. And it seems a little bit um, too strange to believe. Um, I think you know, I don't watch the Americans, but I'm told that for those who do, this is basically actually what's happening in the television show right now. Um, but while that may be the case for Americans, for our European partners and allies, they have been experiencing a variety of Russia's tactics aimed at undermining their democratic institutions, including elections, but also other, uh, other pillars of democracy um, for well over a decade. And in fact, the reality is that some of what Russia is doing today is actually a dust off of its Cold War active measures playbook that it has hypercharged with cyber tools and social media and other forms of new information technology that allows that old playbook to have much greater reach and speed and therefore insidiousness than it did back in the day. Um, so our, my, the colleagues I work with um, from the countries along Russia's periphery in particular um, are, are all too familiar with these tactics. Um, but we have seen, um, as was referenced earlier in some of the other presentations, um, whether it was uh, a DDoS attack on uh, Dutch election systems, um, but also um, hack and release uh, attempts during the Macron campaign in France. Um, there was a hack of the German Bundestag um, in 2015 that many were worried was going to be leaked in advance of the German elections. Um, so a, a broad, um, a broad, uh, we are in good company um, in the sense of, of others who have been experiencing these tactics. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a minute because there's some good news that's embedded there. Um, but let me just kind of give uh, a second, um, just from the sort of national security perspective, um, I'm always very interested in understanding the adversary because that's really important in understanding what might happen next. And so thinking about sort of why is Russia doing this? What is the goal? Why is Vladimir Putin caring about our elections, democratic institutions in Europe, et cetera? Just a few things. Number one, um, trying to sow chaos and undermine democracy is basically the only way for Vladimir Putin, who's leading a declining state, um, to hold on to his grip on power. It allows him to discredit democracy at home. Um, Putin was just inaugurated for his fourth term today. Um, he is now the longest serving leader of Russia since Stalin. Um, we all know sort of how, how to look at um, quote unquote democracy in Russia. Uh, but the reality is this allows Putin to be able um, to discredit democracy overseas to argue to his people at home that really he's the only one who's capable of keeping the country together. He wants to weaken NATO. He wants to break apart the EU. Um, so attacks that undermine, um, you know, whether it's um, interfering in the Brexit vote, which there's um, evidence uh, of Russian interference in Brexit, um, whether that is um, interfering in, in trying to manipulate public opinion around the Catalonia referendum in Spain, which there's also evidence that they did. Again, 
encouraging separatism in Europe kind of weakens EU institutions. Also promoting um, you know, authoritarian pro-Russian leaders in places like Hungary, the Czech Republic. Um, these are also steps that allow uh, Putin to be able to weaken those institutions um, that he is concerned about and sees as a threat to him. The other point I'd like to make on this is um, we saw um, in the last presentation, the slide about Director Comey saying the Russians are going to be back in 2018. Others have said the same thing. I like to think about it differently. They never left. This is not just about an attack on elections. This is about elections being a prime opportunity to target democratic institutions, but the targeting is an ongoing effort. And so we see on a constant basis a variety of activity um, from Russia and related actors trying to undermine the pillars of our democracy. They use a broad spectrum toolkit. We've talked here a lot about the very specific cyber dimensions of this, the hacking piece. Um, but in one of the, the hallmarks of what we've seen across a bunch of these um, different cases in different countries is the combination of hacking and the theft of material with then information operations, weaponizing that information to release it to manipulate public opinion, other forms of information operation, in France, the Russians actually gave a loan to the far-right party, Front National. Um, and then there's other forms of support that they provide to extremists in some European countries. Um, so that's just kind of a broad overview of what they do. But from the national security perspective, I see sort of two big challenges and then a couple of lessons. The biggest challenge that I see, which dovetails on what Chiara was talking about, is there is also a really big disconnect between the national security community and the election administration community and the sort of political community. And so while national security community may understand the adversaries and what they may try to do, um, most of my colleagues, I, I have done a, a lot of good learning um, from folks like Joe and others about how elections actually work and how they're administered, but most national security officials have no clue how elections are administered. And so trying to develop suggestions and policy recommendations and, and to connect with that community is a really big problem on top of the federalism problem um, that we heard about. The other piece I just want to highlight is we talked a lot about the steps to actually harden the systems, but the reality is when, when we talk about the, the probes of the 21 state election systems in 2016, I'll just kind of rewind the tape for folks. It's easy to forget with the speed of today's news cycle where we've been and how things, how things look. But in, in the lead up to the election in 2016, there was a lot of discussion about whether the results might be rigged. And we saw a lot of Russian propaganda being pushed, trying to encourage a narrative about a potentially rigged election. And you could see an alternative universe in which Hillary Clinton would have won and in which evidence would have then come forth that 21 state election systems had been probed. And who knows maybe what happened? Can we believe the veracity of that information? You don't even necessarily need to change votes or manipulate results to sow doubt in people's confidence in the integrity of elections. And that's one of the things that worries me most about how difficult it's been to get steps to really secure the infrastructure because the doubt alone um, may be enough to undermine confidence. The good news is there are lessons we can learn from our European partners and allies, um, and I'm happy to elaborate on those in the Q&A, but a couple of the key things that we see, um, one is the very resiliency kind of measures that we heard about here, hardening defenses, all of that kind of good stuff, but that also means raising awareness in the population so they can be more vigilant both on the cyber side as well as on the information side. There's a great line from a uh, congressman from Texas, Will Hurd, who talks about online stranger danger. You know, we teach kids not to get into vans that they don't know, um, you know, with a person they don't know, not to take candy from a stranger. Why do we believe information from a stranger online, um, just to be fact? Um, so a lot of steps that can be taken there. Um, transparency is incredibly important in all of this. And then deterrence. Um, we really need to, to ensure that there are actions at the national security level that are looking at how do we raise the costs on authoritarian actors and others who may adopt these tactics um, in order to make it more difficult for them um, or more painful for them to do so. Thank you so much. And so part of the aim here as ACS to convene different uh, disciplines so that hopefully this conversation can be replicated by a factor of, I don't know, somebody who knows math can tell me that. Um, I want to just ask, I mean, there are a couple questions. Um, uh, wanted to ask uh, uh, Chara mm -hmm. and um, Commissioner Hicks to talk about 
picking up on the theme of federalism and EAC's role as partnering with states but recognizing they can't be commandeered. And uh, this allocation of $380 million that made it into the budget bill uh, earlier this year, how, how is that process going? How is that partnership going? And uh, where are there opportunities for further engagement? Uh, and where can civil society support that civil engagement? And I also want to put a pin in the question also about um, building up, and we're all contributing to support our democracy, so whether you are going to sign up as a poll watcher or you're going you're to help spread the word about how better to have online literacy so you're not uh, an unwitting victim of a disinformation campaign uh, or harnessing the cybersecurity experts who might be looking for something to hack to tell us, oh, there's a vulnerability there. I'd love for you both to speak about that and what that resiliency looks like. So, Commissioner Hicks and Thank Professor. you. Um, so, uh, basically, the way that this process is going to work is the money was put in the Title I, which means that it's a lot more flexible uh, under HABA to get that money out to the states. So, the goal was to get that money out within 45 days of March 23rd when it was signed by the President. Um, since that time, um, what we have asked for is each state to send to us a two to three page document outlining what they're going to spend that money on. And since, you know, um, since we're in May now, we've gotten about 10 states um, who've sent us what they want to do with that money. Uh, once we get that and we approve it, we'll send that money right out to the states. Um, they have to put their 5% match in within two years, um, but they have five years to spend this money. So it's not like the former HAVA money that's um, being used to gather interest or or being allocated for other things and still sitting there from 10 years ago. This is, you have five years to spend it. So March 23rd, um, you know, five years after 18, 23, um, you have to have that money spent. Uh, and I would just add in, in clarity that uh, the division of the money was uh, statutory. So it was actually Congress's fault uh, that th this is not targeted, is not the commissioner's fault. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Uh, we, I'm not sure what piece you want to talk to. Um, um, so uh, there are a variety of efforts. I'm not sure that civil society or anyone is taking advantage of the, the money for the states because the states will use that money. Um, but the things that we recommend people spend money on are core cybersecurity efforts. For example, I wouldn't recommend anyone unless, you're, unless you're, you're really well prepared, replace machines, for example, between now and, and November. And that's probably a pretty controversial thing to say in a voting rights community. Or even you know, trying to go from zero to 60, so to speak, on doing these election audits. That's something that there, there's sort of a path that you need to, it, and I say this often, you know, a lot of these things are, are what we call a practice. Like cybersecurity is a practice. Auditing is a practice. It's not something you can just have a checklist for and say, I'm done. I mean, you have to think of it as having a checklist that you that changes every day and that you need to spend time cultivating in and of itself. And so that kind of education and, and training is really important. For example, just making sure that people use two-factor authentication or two-step verification, as, as Google calls it, that right in itself will help minimize a lot of the phishing attacks, which is the simplest way to get in and is often the one that us humans are most susceptible to. Can I just add one thing? Yes, um, There are things that can be done right now that are free for the state to do, particularly what they were talking about with Google earlier. But DHS is offering scans and um, the placement of Albert monitors. Albert monitors basically allow for the systems to be looked at to see if there's any sort of um, bad traffic. I, I, can't explain it, maybe Joe can explain it better than me, but it's more of bad traffic coming in. We were able to go up to uh, Albany, which is where the Center for Internet Security is based, and monitor their internet traffic. It basically looked like the old movie War Games, where you would see all this traffic coming in from different parts of the world, trying to target different areas of the world or so forth. But it's more of when that traffic is coming in to make sure that that's not bad traffic. And so those Albert monitors can be placed on the um, voting s the, the systems, uh, the government systems, to see and make sure that everything is functioning the way it should Are be. people using them, taking there, advantage of them? There are a number of experience. states that have taken advantage of it, but again, there are some states that say, we don't want you coming in, 
Um, what are you? What else are you looking at? And so there are other aspects that they can use to ensure that they can go out and hire people using this 380 um, to go out and hire particular cybersecurity experts to do this information for them. But I would say if the federal government is willing to come in and do this for free to allow the federal government to do this so that you're not basically expending two different um, pots of the money that don't, don't need to be expended. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is that I think there's an opportunity. Right now, there's a bit of a waiting list where if you request these federal resources, it takes a little while for them to get to you. But if you look at the DHS's menu of, op menu of things you could request, um, that's, a lot of that stuff is stuff that you don't need to necessarily wait for DHS for. I mean, you want them to come eventually, but there's a lot of preparation you can do. This is where the hacker community comes in, where if you're in the audience or listening to these words and, and you identify with that, that community, there are things like network scanning or using a web, web vulnerability scanning tools. Like Google makes a great one called Lighthouse, which you can use, point out a website, and it will tell you, here are potentially a bunch of ways people would use uh, to break into your website. And you can use that as a kind of a checklist to fix all those things. You better come back in a couple more weeks and check again, because there will be new stuff. Um, there's a variety of things like that. And, and another thing that is also a little controversial, but shouldn't be, is w in, in last year we ran a voting machine hacking village at DEF CON, the biggest hacker uh, conference in the world, 25,000 hackers. There were Russians in, in the room, for example, right? But part of this is making sure that that, that this isn't you know, a secret um, uh, aspect of technology that doesn't also uh, get scrutiny. And so many of these hackers, many of them were under the age of 17, which blew my mind. I'm 40, I'm old. But anyway, <laughs> they can just do things that, that you can't do or that, that you get bored at really, really, really fast at doing. Uh, but we're going to be doing that again in August. And this time, we're, we're, gonna, we're trying to listen to some of the, the, the critics of what we did. And for example, we'll have a polling place with actual rules of engagement that, are, that mimic what you'd see in a real polling place. Um, and we're actually asking some election officials to bring in some of their technology that, that, that they want to. And we can help. We can kick the tires on it. It's some of the best you know, quality assurance you can get. These are some very rabid individuals. When and where will that be? That will be in, at the end of August in Las Vegas. I forget the exact dates, but defcon.org would have that. Laura, I'd love for you to share. I mean, we many of us who live in Washington um, remember the incident about Comet Ping Pong, where disinformation led to someone showing up armed at a pizza parlor because they thought they were going to stop a crime. Um, and obviously, that was not <laughs> an actual event but it affect real people's lives. But I wanted to just uh, ask you to share a little bit about what some of our allies have learned from us, from our 2016 election, and what we can learn from, for example, the recent election in France or otherwise. So in other words, we're not alone with this. Yeah, mostly they've learned not to be like us, <laughs> and not to do what we did, which wasn't very much, which was the problem. Yeah, a couple of really, um, a couple of interesting examples. So um, the Macron uh, case is a really interesting one because they actually, in advance of the election, um, at least what they claim to have done, is to have um, seeded fake accounts with fake information to be compromised. That they, they allowed them to be compromised along with other accounts that were compromised by Russian hackers. You mean email accounts? Email or accounts, okay. yeah, email accounts. But there were documents and other files in there as well. And so when the Russians decided uh, to leak the information um, just before the election, the Macron campaign immediately put out word that um, there was false information planted in the dumps and that therefore none of the information should be believed as true. Now, there were a number of reasons why the information didn't really affect the election. One is it was very, very close at the end. It was like less than in two days before the election that the material was leaked. France also has something um, called a blackout period, media blackout period, 24 hours before the election. We could never have that with our First Amendment here, but that meant the media couldn't be covering these things. Um, so you didn't see the information spreading at the same speed. That's in contrast to here in the United States where 
every major media outlet, by the way, we talk about this lately mostly as a social media problem, but it's important to remember that the New York Times, the Washington Post, all of these um, major newspapers ran weaponized information on the front pages of their newspapers without confirming the veracity and authenticity of the information. We now know some of it was in fact manipulated. Um, and without contextualizing it as weaponized information from a foreign adversary. Um, so one lesson may be um, to, to just try to make the media a little more careful um, than they may already, you know, than they may be inclined to be in terms of, of carrying that information out. There's a double-edged sword to that too. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of untested. Um, another thing I would just say is, well, Macron actually just made a statement today about the fact they've seen Russian disinformation declining in France. Um, which is quite interesting, and I haven't seen any independent measure of that to know if that's true, but Macron has um, very notably put out some very, very strong deterrent messaging uh, to Vladimir Putin about the use of disinformation and how he believes Russian propaganda to be, um, to be seen, um, and, and I think that that is something to note as well. The only other piece I would just note on this that I think is important um, and, and because we're here at Google, I'll choose some examples from, from Google um, and related companies, is that there is, um, when we talk about building resiliency, um, that also requires, in addition to civil society, it requires actions by the tech companies to help close off some of the vulnerabilities that are being exploited by Russia and by the way China's coming right up behind them. So um, using a few examples from Google, you know, we, a few weeks ago, um, I went to Google News and I typed in Russia and NATO, just those search terms, Russia and NATO. The fifth highest ranked article that came up was a Sputnik piece. Sputnik is a known Russian propaganda outlet. Um, and the headline was, uh, UK behind scripple poisoning in order to justify increased NATO defense spending. This is one of many examples I can give. Um, and so basically, we have an, you know, a foreign power that is trying to manipulate these search results. Um, and if anybody's interested, I'm happy to go into details on how they do this. Um, but that's one of just many examples of ways that you know, people, you know, this is about the information environment. This isn't about one piece. You know, people sometimes think, well, I'm not going to be, you know, my views aren't going to be changed by one piece of information. That's not what this is about. This is about a broader information environment and an authoritarian adversarial power trying to manipulate that. And so I think that those are also important steps. The last point, just to make people a little more scared that I would say, is that um, it, it, when we think about what may happen going forward, we can't just think about what's happened in the past. The tools are evolving, um, Russia and others are learning lessons. Like I said, China's coming up behind. So there's a lot of concerns right now about what are known as deep fakes, manipulated video and audio content using AI. Um, when we think about the popularity of YouTube, when we think about what's research that's already been done on um, the, the speed with which um, YouTube's algorithm drives to extremes um, and the concerns about how quickly um, very uh, sort of edgy videos can move. I'm really worried about how quickly manipulated video and audio content may be able to be used um, to sow doubt and chaos in future elections. Yes, I was just about to ask. <laughs> Please chime in. Um, so your statement of, of, stain, of stranger danger online, I think, is well t uh, point well taken. And one thing we haven't quite brought up yet is um, the use of bots on Twitter. So, so apparently, one of the things that happened in the 2016 election is you had bots pretending to be Bernie Sanders supporters who would pick fight with Hillary Clinton supporters. And the Hillary Clinton supporters would get really frustrated with these bots for good reason. You couldn't change their mind. And you'd keep on arguing and arguing and trying to make your point. And all you would get back was you know, some version of nonsense. And so one thing I would suggest, besides um, volunteering to be a poll worker, is think about your own behavior online and don't get into arguments with computers. <laughs> and, on, and I know on that question, I mean, uh, and I would like to pivot and make uh, our panel available for Q&A from the audience, but just a couple final thoughts. Uh, <coughs> There's a lot of discussion about what tech companies should do as a matter of policy or can do, given the rapid evolution of uh, technological and evolution to these challenges. But also, I was wondering, um, Chara, if you can just share a little bit of a landscape of legislation that is percolating out there, separate from the policy question, but what legislation is 
uh, percolating in this space related to election security. Thank you. So um, I'm going to defer election security to my other yes. fellow, <laughs> fellow um, panelists. Um, one other thing to keep an eye on is the question of uh, dark money and uh, where, where funding comes from in our elections. So dark money, really briefly, is money that has been funneled through an opaque nonprofit such that the voters can't tell where that money came from. And a lot of us in the campaign finance world have been worried about dark money for a very long time because there's this lack of transparency and because it could be hiding illegal foreign money, which is uh, completely not allowed in our elections. You can't use foreign money for federal elections, for state elections, or even for local elections for dog catcher. But if you have dark money, you don't know if it's foreign or not. And so one of the things that we need to improve is disclosure of where money has come from. So one of the pieces of legislation that has been introduced again and again and again is called the Disclose Act. And it would bring more transparency to where money is uh, flowing in our elections. Uh, another problem that was highlighted in the 2016 election was that there were Facebook ads which should have been reportable under FECA, the Federal Election Campaign Act. Um, the ones that were reportable were, were the ones that said, vote for Jill Stein. Those should have been reported. They were not, and apparently they were purchased in rubles. <coughs> um, and <laughs> so it's not the rubles that are the problem, it's that if it came from a foreign national, that is illegal. Um, so you have a double violation. One, that they were foreign um, funded, and two, they were unreported. So there's another piece of legislation called the Honest Ads Act, which would try to get more transparency for ads that are online. Great, thank you. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I want to <laughs> uh, first see if anybody in the audience uh, would like to ask our panelists any questions about this topic. Thank you very much. And there are two roaming mics, so if you raise your hand. I just Wait. ask that if you ask a question, you identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, Maurice Turner, CDT, working with Joe on election security. Um, this question is probably more geared toward Laura. I have a question regarding um, responses. So given the recent elevation, or made officially elevation of Cybercom, uh, the discussions about uh, sort of how PPD-20 might be pushed aside, um, do you think, what do you think the chances are that we'll see a public cyber response if there is actual attribution of Russian interference in 2018? So, the, so cyber provide, like, I could go down a really big rabbit hole about organizational problems with respect to cybersecurity um, in our federal government. Um, Cybercom is really in charge of a couple of things. One is securing our government infrastructure, everything that has a .gov, .mil, you know, um, extension after, after it's, um, after the website name. Um, but the, um, and it also is in charge of offensive cyber. Defensive cyber really officially rests with the Department of Homeland Security. Most of what we're talking about here is defensive cyber um, in terms of the measures that are necessary to actually secure U.S. infrastructure, um, you know, whether in the private sector or in other parts of the government. Um, on the offensive side, uh, you know, I don't have particular insight into what this administration may or may not be thinking about that particular question. Um, I do think that the questions of hackback and of offensive cyber in this space are um, both interesting and challenging ones. Um, especially, you know, the, the reality is that these are asymmetric tools for a reason, um, and they create really. They, it is much harder for us to figure out how to respond than it is for the adversary to take these tactics against us in the first place. I am personally much more of a fan of going on offense in ways that speak to our own asymmetric advantages. Um, so while that may mean taking down certain key pieces of 
um, infrastructure related to how attacks, cyber attacks were conducted um, and doing some offensive cyber in that way. Um, I'm much more interested in going after the things that like Putin cares about most and that would be his money. And by the way, that's where he's most vulnerable because his money is pretty much all stolen from the Russian people and invested in the West and exploiting a whole bunch of loopholes in our um, financial and banking infrastructure and real estate infrastructure that allow him to remain in power. So I think in narrow cases, I'm a proponent of offensive cyber in, this, in these instances, but I'm much more interested in, again, looking to where, where the playing field is more favorable to us. Another question from the audience? We have three hands, this gentleman here on the left. Hi, um, so you guys have spent a lot of time talking about... Can you identify yourself? Uh, hi, um, Jake LaPeruk, uh, Project and Government Oversight. Um, you guys have spent a lot of time talking about um, preventative measures, different ways to stop interference from elections from occurring, but also highlighted the fact that um, you know, a lot of these are very long-term projects and that we probably won't have time to implement many of them before... Um, our next major election, or even the ones after that. So I'm curious, just on, you know, for everyone on the panel's basic idea of what might be effective ways, not necessarily to think about for prevention of attacks on our elections, but um, mediating harms. You know, if a huge swath of electronic voting machines, or a state's registration database, or just websites, you know, that have information that we need, like where your polling place is, is disrupted in a really significant way and run the EV of the auction and we look and say, well, you know, we blew it, this harm is done, How, what do we do next? So I would go back to 18 years ago during the 2000 election, we have people who were born that year now eligible to vote. They don't remember or remember any of the issues that happened in 2000. So I go towards their level of confidence. How can we remain to allow people to have that confidence in our process? And one thing that I've always heard from folks in my community is, why should I vote when my vote's not gonna count? Well, your vote's not gonna count if you never cast it. So that's the one thing of making sure that people are making sure that voter registration is up to date, uh, making sure that they have every piece of necessary whatever that they need to go to vote so that there's no question about whether or not they're eligible to do so, um, but also to serve as a poll worker. Um, because if you're in the polling place to, to cast your ballot, they're not gonna deny that. So um, that's you know three things right there. The other piece of that is um, this is a long-term scale because elections have been occurring in the United States since 1776, and they're gonna hopefully continue on for another whatever number of years. And so every two years with the federal election cycle, uh, we want to make sure that the, the EAC wants to make sure that the states have the necessary resources to um, make sure that those elections function the way that they, they should. Um, in the past 10 years, that's been doing things, or I should say the past five years, because President Obama put in $500 million to the process. So in the past seven or eight years, that's been us giving resources to the states in terms of best practices, uh, videos, going out to the states to, to inform them on ways to do this sorts of things. In the next two to three years, we hope that that's spending this $380 million. If Congress and the President should come back and say, hey, we want to put more money into it, great. If not, then the EAC will hopefully be there to dictate some of the things that states can still do to um, ensure that the process remains secure. So <coughs> bad election officials, there's a lot of things that make an election official a good election official. There's a lot of things that make a bad election official a bad election official. The thing that makes the best election officials the best and the worst the worst is contingency planning. Uh, election officials are massive nerds when it comes to contingency planning. And often they're doing things like printing you know, you may have a fully electronic voting system that requires no paper ballots, but they may print half of what they may need if everything shuts down just to make sure they have that, you know, on hand. And then people complain, well, you never used that stuff. Well, <laughs> yes, we used it because it was part of our contingency plan that we never had to put in place. <laughs> Cybersecurity, and so the, the things that I know a lot about, uh, is just another place for them to nerd out on contingency planning. And so, for example, 
of the, the two states that were compromised. In fact, there will be news this week about another. Um, but of all those cases that we know of, everything worked. A couple little things didn't work, but there's this mesh of what we call as, ner as, as cybersecurity nerds, defense in depth. So if one thing fails you, you fall through into another part of the contingency plan. And so I, I wouldn't worry so much about that. The mitigations, for example, are things like we expect them to try and attack certain kinds of the system that aren't as vetted or protected as well as others. So there are certain things that aren't subject to federal and state certification. Uh, electronic poll books, if they were to attack those, this is me giving you an example, if they were to attack those, you may all of a sudden need a ton of provisional ballots or ways to mark those ballots that don't also um, add to the line. Because you know many of us in this room have the luxury of being able to come back to a polling place if we, for some reason, can't wait in line. But there are a lot of people that we want their votes to cast to that don't have that luxury. And so it's just another form of contingency planning. It's just one that you can really, if you, if you mess up <laughs> royally, you can mess up really, really bad. And so that's why there's a lot of these tools, like, for example, Knox County, uh, Knox County, Tennessee, sorry, should have had a DDoS mitigation platform up. I hope all election officials, one, know what that means, and two, knows that there's at least two free choices as well as a bunch of other ones they can pay for if they want to to get that kind of thing. Yes, please. And I would add that it's not all bad news. So an example of a state doing the right thing, before the 2017 elections in Virginia, Virginia decided to get rid of its paperless ballots. Woo! Woo so good, go Virginia. Get rid of the paperless ballots. Yes. Just yeah. want to make sure people heard. Yes. Um, and you know, other states don't have to wait on the federal funding. They can make it a priority in their own state's budgets. I know that there's, there are, <laughs> I live in the real world. I, I realize we need more money now. But part of that can come from the state coffers instead of just relying on the federal dollars. Um, another good thing that states have been doing is automatic voter registration. And that changes the default. So in most states still, the default is that you're not registered to vote. You as a voter have to affirmatively register to vote in order to vote in the next election. But in the states that have adopted automatic voter registration, the Are there many? There are 10. Is it up to 11? <laughs> it's at least 10. Yeah, okay. to um, and so in those states, the default is now that you are registered. And I think that is another type of resiliency against um, you know, people who would try to mess with voter registration rules. Was there, I think there were a couple other hands uh, right here. Yes. Hi, my name is Tina Iotis. Um, to the extent that the election uh, infrastructure ISAC has just been set up, and I know that CIS has deep knowledge having um, run the multi-state ISAC, do you think that those folks are going to be successful in building trust with the states when a lot of states have problems with working with ostensibly a structure that works with the federal government, the whole states' rights issue? Um, and secondly, do you think they're going to be able to work collaboratively with the Financial Services ISAC, which uh, of all the ISACs has the deepest knowledge and the most understanding of nation state threats? So I, I, um, I don't, I'm trying to figure out the best way to attack that question. Um, so um, I'm pretty sure, you know, all the goodness that was the multi-state ISAC where elections were concentrated before it went to the election infrastructure ISAC, EI ISAC, that's, a lot of that's been carried over. It's just now there's not a ton of non-election specific stuff that the, the people that are sort of the leads uh, in, in the states and, and some localities that now participate in those things, they, they have sort of a narrower focus. And so many of them, by all means, should still pay attention to that other, that other, th that other stuff. But you know, uh, I, I don't think that's going to be a, a big deal. I don't think there's a much of a problem with sort of the tech folks in the states and localities recognizing this is a place where people like you from around the country are going to be because there are you know forums for discussion like we saw something weird we're not sure it's a, vul a vulnerability or, 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 a, or a weakness or whatever can we talk through this maybe even just by having that conversation you've made your system more resilient even in, without the presence of an attack um, there was a last piece of your question that I forgot I'm sorry it was in relation to the FSI ah with FSI sec so, so this is, this is going to be interesting, and mostly in the sense that 
you want to make sure that the capabilities and awareness of folks being targeted by nation states, and frankly, I'm worried uh, increasingly about organized crime, not necessarily just nation states. You know, this is, I love the industrial strength hacking. Like, I'm not sure if, if, if that is just such a cool phrase. Anyway, but so that kind of thing that's either, you know, small industry or, you know, you can think of organized crime as sort of its own industry, right? I'm worried about that. Uh, the, the, many of these people, once they get good at this kind of this stuff, realize, oh, geez, I could make money off this by hitting financial services, right? And so you do see a, ten, a general progression. In fact, there's one cyber actor who started off hacking the DNC and elections websites and stuff like that, but then moved to financial services because he wanted the Lamborghini or whatever, right? Um, so th that's going to be a bigger challenge because there's a natural <coughs> progression one way uh, over the, to the other. And I am just not the person that's familiar with the cross ISAC or ISAO communication methods that sounds like, that sounds combinatorial, which math means it could blow up quick. But. I'm mindful that I think our hosts are going to tell us we need to get out of here soon. Um, so I wanted to just, and so for those who can stay and have further question and answer, we welcome that. Uh, but I wondered if uh, we could do a rapid round. Give me your one sentence, your one takeaway that you want this audience to know from this conversation. So uh, and, and two-factor authentication, use it. Uh, I think that Congress needs to dust off its uh, election clause power. Um, that is the part of the Constitution that says, in the first instance, the states get to determine the time, places, and manners of federal elections. But if uh, the Congress wants to step in, they ultimately have that congressional um, power, um, I'm sorry, that, that constitutional power. So I hope that they actually use that in service of defense of our elections. The Election Assistance Commission, assistance is our middle name. <laughs> uh, this is a multi-dimensional attack, but the main goal of it is to try to sow chaos and division in our country. And the more that we respond in a divided way, the more that we actually play right into the hands of those who are trying to attack us. So at the end of the day, um, you know, a bipartisan, nonpartisan response is really the only way to triumph over those who are trying to undermine our country. Amen to that. So thank you all. I hope that this is the beginning of an ongoing conversation for all of us to cross-fertilize, talk to people from other disciplines, and figure out how we can protect our, the vibrancy of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you.